Hey, what is up, everybody? Good afternoon. We are coming to you live uh, right after the Chargers were participating in a game. And Alex uh, accordingly wore victory pink. Uh, not really. That was kind of uh, unplanned by Alex. But uh, Alex is back uh, at medical school. So, Alex, I hope you uh, had a, a safe travel. And how you doing, man? Yeah, I had some safe travels. Uh, I also have some friends over here. You can hear the birds in the background. Um, so that's gonna that's gonna happen over these next couple months uh, until I'm back home. But uh, no, it was safe travels, and I'm happy Justin Herbert won Pro Bowl MVP next year. Let's win the real MVP. But let's yes. get that. Yes, absolutely. And of course, Tyler is here as well. Tyler, how you doing, man? I'm doing very well. I hear that the birds are back in Alex's room, but you know he returned to medical school, so. If I'm not mistaken, the birds and the bees are back as well. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So we got a fun show planned for you guys today. I'm uh, going to talk about some of the Pro Bowl stuff. You know, it was a fun game. Obviously, nothing special. But uh, since Justin Herbert won uh, Offensive MVP, I, I feel like it's worth talking about. Um, and then uh, the Chargers, of course, hired Ryan Ficken as their new special teams coordinator. Uh, less than 12 hours after we recorded our, our episode on Wednesday night. So uh, Alex got to do an immediate takeaway video. If you missed that, please go check that out. Um, and so we'll be talking about that. So Tyler and I can give our thoughts there. And then we'll wrap today's show up uh, chatting about the Senior Bowl that happened uh, throughout this week. And the game, of course, was yesterday. So uh, first things first, I mentioned the Pro Bowl. Justin Herbert, of course, wins team MVP, throwing two touchdowns. Derwin James gets an interception. Uh, Rashawn Slater was playing left tackle and right tackle. The NFL could not spell his name correctly, but I mean, he played well, it seems like. Uh, and then Corey Lindsley got to play, I think, most of the game. I think he played all the first three quarters and then Ryan Kelly after that. So uh, Chargers had a strong showing at the Pro Bowl. Uh, Tyler, any uh, any first takeaways from what we watched this afternoon? I did not watch the game, so my takeaways are only the highlights from the game. I heard it was absolutely terrible, so I don't think I missed anything. But it was nice to see Justin Herbert out there throwing some dimes in between two defenders, pressure in his face, the corner of the end zone. The guy is starting to really obviously master that quick game and seeing him throw to a tight end. I think the talk of the time was everyone was saying, let's get Justin Herbert a tight end, man. Like, no more of this Jared Cook stuff. Well, I don't think they can afford a tight end like a David Njoku, if they're extending Mike Williams or tagging Mike Williams. It sounds like this draft is set up for the Chargers to really find a good tight end at different points in this draft. Yeah, you know, uh, I, as the only person on this uh, in this trio that watched that game, uh, it, it was kind of a, an abject disaster. But I mean, it's fun. Like, it's, it's kind of a blooper reel kind of game. And there were some really cool moments. Of course, Justin Herbert had some great ones. So um, that throw, the first touchdown throw to Mark Andrews was just unreal. Like he, th he lasered that thing into a tiny, tiny window. So, I mean, it was really cool to see if, if Herbert were not playing, I, I would not have watched, you know, if it were just the, just Derwin and the offensive lineman, I would not uh, be watching that game. So having Justin Herbert in it, it'd be cool watching him be able to, uh, be the only quarterback that really like made an impact was even cooler because, uh, the other five must have gotten together and, and arranged to throw nothing but interceptions and do nothing of importance. So uh, it was fun, man. Like there was nothing else to do today. So watching Justin Herbert get a uh, Pro Bowl offensive MVP was was fine for me. Yeah, I, I thought it was a fun game, uh, at least from the clips that I've watched. You know, you get to see Derwin James get an interception, although, I mean, the interception kind of came off the back yeah. of Russell Wilson not caring where he was throwing right. the football. So that's fun. Uh, Justin Herbert, obviously, the, the dime to Mark Andrews is probably the highlight of the day. Just like it felt like he should have been, you know, beat in every way there. That should have been an interception. And somehow Justin Herbert just fits it right in that window. And, you know, I don't know about David and Joku, but, you know, you see what Justin Herbert can do over the middle of the field with a legitimate tight end that doesn't drop the ball all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, that'd be fun to have. Not yeah. saying Mark Andrews, not saying David and Joku, but they could kind of get someone to get him more of that uh, middle of the field production. That would be kind of fun. So those were my kind of main pro bowl takeaways. Um, and he won pro bowl MVP. So that's good. Yeah. It was a nice little uh, consolation prize uh, after the end of the season. And it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing, right? You know, you get a nice little trophy. Um, I think the NFL is awarding him $20,000 to go to his charity of choice. I can't remember which charity he had, but 
I mean, it's a good little good little event, good little trophy. As for the tight end, so Mark Andrews uh, obviously is not happening. He uh, signed an extension <laughs> after uh, during last off season, so he uh, is going to be a Baltimore Raven for at least four or five years. But I think you guys both raised the point, right? Like that Justin Herbert clearly likes throwing to tight ends. You know, he had a great connection with Hunter Henry and uh, the Chargers understandably were uh, moving off of him. And then you signed Jared Cook. But I think the Chargers have a, a good window into obtaining a new tight end. This tight end class in the draft really sounds like it's fantastic. I haven't watched a ton of film on them, but, you know, uh, several of them drew rave reviews at the Senior Bowl and other couple at the shrine bowl the last couple weeks so if they want to go that route and draft a tight end relatively early i think that makes some sense i think there are some other cheaper tight ends that they could possibly take you know a, a shot on in terms of maybe reviving a career of, of somebody that you know hasn't had a ton of success but you know like a hayden hurst i think comes to mind right there but you know we'll, we'll see what david and joku costs uh pff has him rather high uh, I think Spot Rack has him at like four million a year. So, you know, we'll have to see how that changes over the next few months. But if they if they're able to get David and Joker, then I think they they can take that chance. But uh, Herbert definitely likes his tight ends, man. And and of course, Donald Parham, Trey McKitty could certainly take uh, steps forward. But I, I think they definitely will be adding someone to the room. I just don't know, you know, like we talked about a few weeks ago, if that's going to be like a true tight end one or something to kind of depth behind Parham and Kitty and Steven Anderson. I will just say uh, last Pro Bowl. Oh. Well, Alex died, yeah. so I'll go next. Um, yes, obviously you're hearing about guys from the Shrine Bowl, converted quarterbacks who literally did not play tight end until they got to the Shrine Bowl, and they're torching guys apparently. So there are guys yeah. at all points of this draft that sound amazing. I don't know if Alex is about to say this, but one guy – that really did his best audition for the Chargers. Really seemed like Tyron Matthew, man. He was yeah. all over their social media, yeah. liking, retweeting everything they did. I don't think he joins the Chargers, but boy, he was really trying to make himself known and connect himself to the team. Yeah, I, I'd love to have uh, Tyron Matthew if that was a possibility. Um, and if he came at the right price, that would just be insane to have him next to Derwin James. And then I saw him in the all white you know, jersey Photoshop someone did. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready for this to happen now. Thank you. Um, but my takeaway, my final There's Pro Bowl takeaway. Oh, I've already seen like two swaps already. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, crank, they're cranking them out there on Chargers Twitter. There we go. Um, but the one takeaway I was going to say is I saw Justin Herbert win the Pro Bowl MVP. And then I saw Max Crosby win the defensive MVP. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's why we're in the Pro Bowl. Forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it was really funny. I guess there were a small amount of Raiders fans that booed him on the podium. And, uh, you know, it just... <laughs> You know, he shrugged it off, and then Max Crosby was like, yeah, that's Raider love. It's like, okay, it's the Pro Bowl. It's not that serious. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it was a fun day, man. And Tyron Matthew, there was a ton of Chargers-related content going his way. Of course, you know, the video that went viral of uh, Justin Herbert throwing to – I don't know if that's Tyron's son or just a kid that was happened to be wearing a Tyron Matthew jersey. But, I mean, it was fun, man. I, I don't know if they'll be able to go that route. I don't know if that's necessarily a need unless they're like truly planning on Derwin James playing linebacker and slot corner more often. Um, but listen, man, if, if they want to add Tyron Matthew to the secondary, like by all means, like this is the all in season. You can probably get Tyron for a two year cheap, relatively cheap ish deal. Uh, certainly not going to break the bank, but uh, I'm not going to say no. Like if they sign, if they want to sign him, like go right ahead. I think he's a fantastic player and that way you don't really need to sign a slot corner because you can play Tyron there. You can play Derwin there. You can play Mark Webb there. This year Adderley there. So I think that gives them a ton of options, but it, it, it's all fun, right? Like obviously safety is not a big need, but uh, it was, uh, it's definitely fun to think about for sure. Well, also, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to Gavino later this week and we'll do a video together about the senior bowl, but he brought up a safety that they, the chargers had met twice with, if I'm not mistaken. So mm -hmm. there might be, I don't know about Tyron Matthew level, but there's certainly something there about looking at safety in this draft. Yeah, and like I said, I, I think they'll add a body there just for death. I mean, they have 11 draft picks, for God's sakes, this year. So, you know, they can take some chances this year. Um, are any other thoughts here about the Pro Bowl before we uh, move on for uh, the next conversation? Can't wait to not be there next year. Yeah, 
Exactly. That's obviously the goal. Um, all right. So as I mentioned, obviously the Chargers did sign Ryan Ficken or hire Ryan Ficken, I should say, to be their special teams coordinator after they uh, were able to let Darius Swinton walk. So Ryan Ficken comes over from the Minnesota Vikings. As far as I can tell, there weren't any like blatantly obvious connections to Brandon Staley. So this is a bit of an alteration off the path uh, from the previous coaching hires where everybody else on the staff, he has a connection to. So, uh, Ficken, of course, comes from the Vikings. He was there for 15 years. He was only special teams coordinator for one year, which was last year. Uh, but he did appears to have done great work on paper for the Vikings. Uh, Tyler, your initial takeaways from the Chargers decision to hire Ryan Ficken as their special teams coordinator. I think one of the best ways to gauge what a coach or a player is like, you can Google what they've done, sure, or you can look at the reactions of fans on social media. And I'll tell you what, there were a lot of Vikings fans who were very sad and unhappy that he was leaving. Again, I, I don't know the whole story of this guy. I certainly didn't, didn't know he existed until three days ago or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. But it sounds like people are going to miss him. And you look at his resume, and again, these things are all on paper, and he wasn't the primary special teams coordinator. But with the guys that he worked with while in Minnesota, you had guys make all pro kick, Cordell Patterson, obviously, and it helps to take a guy in the first round. But Cordell Patterson makes first team all pro. He made two Pro Bowls, I believe. He made uh, first team all pro on the Pro Football Writers Association another year. You know, they had guys that punters were breaking records of 70 plus yard punts. Um, they had a punter have no touchbacks on one year. There's just, so, there's the guys not just. It's not just, oh, they had like a top 10 special teams unit here or this guy did, you know, had a career year here. There are guys setting records while he was there working with these guys on special teams. So how much of it was him? I don't know. We'll never know. We can't prove how much he really influenced, you know, how well these guys did. But clearly guys performed well while he was there. And in his first year as a special teams coordinator, they were 13th in DBOA, which isn't amazing. But guess what? 13th is better than 28th. <laughs> so I will take that all day long. Yeah. And I also do like that he was. I want to say with the Vikings as well, a wide receiver, assistant, assistant wide receivers and running backs coach. So there's something there. It's not just, you know, oh, I'm a special teams coordinator. I'm just some random guys are going to come over into my group and I don't really work with them all that much, but I'm going to try to get them involved. No, like he knows how to work with wide receivers. He knows where to work with running backs. So if the Chargers bring in somebody else that's not Andre Roberts or they're trying to get a different punt returner or whatever, work on the gunners, whatever it is, a rice relationship, working relationship between, you know, I know a little bit of offense, wide receiver and running backs. And I'm really obviously knowledgeable about special teams. It's a really good balance. So, you know, where he's been in Minnesota, it looks like things are really good. Don't know how much was him, but it seems like it's a good hire. And at the end of the day, it's not McMahon. It's not someone that was terrible. I was. I would rather have this guy that we have no known connection between him and Staley versus McMahon, who was an obvious connection, but was not very good. So I, I'm pretty happy with this. There's nothing here I could say that sounds like, you know, there's nothing bad that I can tell. And that's a good thing. Yeah, to your point, a uh, couple of points, you know, uh, there were a lot of Vikings players who were, you know, expressed a lot of, you know, gratitude and happiness about him getting promoted to special teams coordinator last year, including Adam Thielen. Uh, and I think Justin Jefferson said something about it as well uh, after he left. So uh, the Vikings players, you know, appeared to be big fans of Ryan Fickens as well. And you know, you don't stay in a place in the NFL for 15 years if you're not doing something right. And so I think that kind of speaks to at least the character of Ryan Ficken as a person and, and his capabilities as a professional head coach or, or position coach, special teams coach, whatever you want to say. Um, but I, I think this is a really good hire. And, you know, the, the Vikings being 13th, like that's not necessarily like elite, but we were all super stoked when the Chargers were 23rd in DVOA after week 17. So if the if the Chargers can take another 10 spots up, then I'll be stoked, man. And I think this is, you know, we'll never know really until the season gets going how this is, how this hire is going to turn out. But I think this is a positive hire. I think things on paper look very well for Ryan Ficken and the future of this team. It's going to be really interesting because, you know, one of the biggest things with what happened in the Vikings is that it appears that he had a lot of say over personnel and he kind of decided to go towards the young player route. I mean, their kicker, their punter, and their main returner were all young players that he drafted or had a say in like promoting, as opposed to rolling with Dan Bailey and Dustin Colquitt 
and whoever was their returner in 2020. So uh, that could maybe paint a picture that the Chargers are kind of moving off of players like Ty Long and Dustin Hopkins and uh, unfortunately Matt Overton. We'll have to see how kind of that pans out and maybe Andre Roberts even. Uh, but I'm curious to see really like how much of a say he has over roster control and picking like hand picking his specialists or not. Yeah, um, I, I was the, the thing that struck me most was that it was a lateral move. Um, the fact that he was the special teams coordinator of the Vikings then comes to the Chargers, you know, obviously, but well, we'll never know. But the Vikings kind of fought hard to keep him. Um, and then he ended up walking yeah. to the Chargers anyway. Um, I feel like when looking at any offensive, defensive, or special teams coordinator hire, the one thing you want to see is improvement from year to year. And I mean, the Vikings were dead last in the NFL with the Chargers back in 2020. Yeah. Uh, he comes in, we talked about ninth in uh, special teams by PFF and 13th in DVOA. Um, but there were also a couple key metrics that I mentioned in my video where the Vikings were the best in the league. I um, mean, kick return defense, they allowed the fewest yards in the league. Um, I think they were 10th in terms of kick return yards and then second uh, in kick return average. So, I mean, they were really solid. You know, they bring in a guy like uh, Kane and Wongwu, uh, who they drafted in the fourth round last year, and he becomes yeah. one of the best kick returners in the NFL. So I think the fact that, you know, you can take that or take Jordan Berry, who they had as their punter, um, and, and turn some of these guys that were not stars uh, into, you know, potential stars of special teams. Like, I, I think that is a really good trait to have as a special teams coordinator. Um, I do think the personnel question will be interesting, whether it does end up being that, you know, four person duo of Roberts uh, over 10 long and then um, Hopkins, you know, because they all are effectively free agents. I mean, Ty Long is going to be given a spot to, you know, compete in camp for that punting job. But I think we should pretty much view it as like, you know, we'll see who's back and we'll see who's not because I don't think there's a spot in there that's uh, really locked down. So I'll be interested to see what Ficken uh, does with the special teams personnel as well as, um, you know, if he'll actually be given that personnel control. Because, I mean, if he made a lateral move, you could kind of say that, oh, well, maybe they offered him the chance to you know change some of these special teams players out. So. We'll see what happens there, but on paper, I think it's a really good hire, and I think you could just tell how much better discipline the Vikings were as a team in 2021 on special teams than in 2020, considering that it was a lot of the same guys um, playing a lot of these special teams positions, not just um, kicker, or returner, or punter, but also uh, I think the more important thing for the Chargers on some level is also the guys that are going to be playing you know, return defense, the guys who are going to be blocking out in front, right? So... Um, we'll see how it pans out, but I really do like this Ryan Fick and hire. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see, like I said, the, the roster say that he'll have because, I mean, I, I think I'm okay with Dustin Hopkins coming back and, and being the guy. I think he, you know, finished 18 for 20. He missed a few extra points. I think, uh, I think he definitely brought a stability element to the kicker position that uh, we haven't really experienced recently. So I'm okay with Dustin Hopkins returning. It really is just the other positions that i think are in doubt because specifically punter and returner you know andre roberts uh should be back i think we all three of us would agree that we would like to see him back and uh hopefully be a little bit more involved on offense next year but you know he is up there in age you know he was kind of a mid-season addition so if they wanted to uh draft somebody you know i i think that would make a lot of sense you know there's um, you know, we'll talk about the senior bowl in a second, but Alex's guy from Rutgers, I forget his uh, first name, but Milan or Melton, is it? Bo Melton. Bo Melton, you know, looked like he's got some juice as a returner. He could be kind of a late round pick. There's Velas Jones, who I, I'm a big fan of as well, who uh, played at USC and then Tennessee. And that could, you know, he looks like Andre Roberts to me, like the way that he runs and everything. So if they wanted to go younger to replace Roberts, I wouldn't necessarily be surprised. And then the, Kind of the big one, I think, is Ty Long because this this punting class is really good, man. Like, you know, I'm not going to say you pretend to know everything about punters, but, you know, of course, there's Matt Ariza, who everybody seems to want. But there were two really good punters in the Senior Bowl. There were two really good punters at the Shrine Bowl. So if the Chargers want to use a sixth or a seventh round pick on a punter, like, I, I think this is probably the year to do it. And then you kind of, uh, you know, give Ty Long the Michael Badgley treatment from last year. 
Yeah, I think overall, outside of the punter position, I would love for the Chargers to maintain stability and kind of that same group moving forward. You yeah. talked to Matt Overton. You guys had a great long interview with Matt Overton. He talked about, listen, these guys are a lot of these guys are in year one, but in year two and in year three, these guys are going to get better and better, play tighter as a unit, you know, be smarter about everything, know how to play special teams, buy into the special teams idea and playing on special teams to earn your role on the roster and all that. So I'd like them to mostly keep everything intact. I would still prefer they keep Roberts. I don't need a kick returner. And honestly, do we trust them to take a kick returner at this point? Is it just going to be another Kelly, another round tree back there? I'd rather just roll with Roberts and someone who just knows sure. how to, you know, read whatever he needs to do, the blocking. Or it was a leverage, I think he said, Overton said in the interview. I'd rather just keep him around. So I'd like to keep basically everyone involved except maybe Ty Long. It just seems like now's a good time to move on. Yeah, you know, the other connection there, of course, is Cordero Patterson. Of course, uh, Tyler and I had some fun on Twitter uh, after the Chargers announced that hire because now they have, the Chargers have uh, Ficken, who used to coach him, be his position coach. Brandon Staley coached him at, uh, I forget the name, but, you know, junior college back way back in the day. And then, of course, was with him in Chicago. So, listen, man, if they wanted to add Cordero Patterson, I don't think he's necessarily going to break the bank. And I think he's probably a little bit of a downgrade in terms of returner from Andre Roberts, but I, I think he brings so much more on offense that that would be a really fun addition. Again, you know, I don't know if the Chargers can afford to make that kind of addition, uh, you know, financially, but they have several connections now. Cordell Patterson is a free agent. It doesn't really seem likely that he's going to return to Atlanta. So if they wanted to sign Cordell Patterson, man, like they have a way to go and do it. And like I said, I don't think he would necessarily break the bank. Yeah. Um, I'll just say last takeaway when it comes to Ryan Ficken, I really hope this works. Uh, cause this is the Chargers fourth special teams coordinator in three years. Uh, so, you know, have not been able to nail down that position. Remember they fired George Stewart, uh, and then had a, uh, replacement there. And then obviously Darius went now we're on Ryan Ficken. So I do hope this works out. I do think he has the credentials, um, you know, based on what we kind of come to expect. But yeah, um, I, Brandon Staley needs to get this one right because this could be the yeah. difference between, you know, missing and making the playoffs next year. Yeah, like you guys are saying, I think this is a stability hire, hopefully, that, that can really kind of take this group because, you know, we, we talked about Nick Neiman on our linebacker episode. You know, he was all rookie special teamer, according to, uh, the Players Writers Association. And so he's somebody that Matt Overton really liked and had a lot of good things to say about. Of course, you have potentially, you know, a Drew Tranquil type of player. If he's not starting on defense, you have Steven Anderson as kind of the veterans. But, you know, Chris Rumpf played a ton of special team snaps for them. And, and so did Kimon Hall. Those are three really, really young players. And so I, I think this is definitely, you know, a, a year in which a higher in which points to uh, stability being kind of the, the hope going forward. So um, obviously we will keep you guys posted. If there are any moves, I would be shocked if they signed a punter. Um, but it, it seems like that's going to be Ty Long or a draft pick. Um, all right, guys, any final thoughts on uh, the hiring of Ryan Ficken? All right. So uh, now we are going to talk about some senior bowl takeaways. Uh, this is something that uh, I had a ton of fun scouring Twitter and the practice film that I was able to get my hands on had a great time interacting with people. Of course, wish I could have been there in person, but you know, the senior bowl is obviously something that the chargers have really taken to heart under Tom Telesco. And they generally pick three or four or five players from the senior bowl each year, this year with 11 picks, they might pick, you know, eight or nine, you know, who <laughs> knows, but um, I, I think this is a really good week for evaluation and, you know, I haven't had a ton of time to dive into the film, but I saw a lot of good things from uh, a lot of these players. And Alex, we'll start with you. I don't know how much you were able to kind of be in tune with that. Uh, but any general takeaways from what you were able to see from the Senior Bowl this week? Yeah, um, I think my general takeaways are uh, this is one hell of a defensive line class once you yes. get past, you know, the first round. Obviously, there's a lot of conversation about Jordan Davis, but um, now you have... Uh, Crap, I'm forgetting the guy's name. We're just one senior bowl MVP off the top of my head. Uh, Perry on uh, Winfrey. Perry on Winfrey. Um, and just a lot of guys that have been kind of dominating some of the offensive line matchups at times. Uh, yeah. and making it uncomfortable for poor uh, Daniel Falele, who was, you know, <laughs> falling down on those first couple days. So yeah. uh, the defensive line class, I think, past the first round has looked good. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I think we talked about the senior bowl as a way to show opportunity. And I, there were two running backs who kind of caught my eye this week and uh, Damian Pierce and Abram Smith from Florida and Baylor. Um, I really like what they both put on tape and thought they were interesting. And the, the common connection between them is they didn't really have a lot of production um, at Baylor or at Florida just because they didn't get playing time. <laughs> I think they said in the senior bowl yeah. game that uh, Abram Smith's uh, 78 yards uh, he had like in all of his four years at Baylor. And <laughs> he just had like, you know, 40 in the senior bowl game. So, um, you know, just kind of some crazy stats like that. So you just get a chance to see these guys um you know, all have a chance to kind of uh, show their stuff. And so I was really impressed by the defensive line group um, as well. Um, and then, yeah, of course, I, I think the interesting conversation, not that it's super relevant to the Chargers because the Chargers do have Justin Herbert, uh, but the quarterback uh, conversation. And I think you now have probably a couple guys that are going to go in the top 15. I feel like for a while we've been talking about this as a bad quarterback class, at least in comparison to last year. But you've sort of started to see the Malik Willis hype train uh, you yeah. know, leave the station as well as Kenny Pickett, uh, as well as a lot of those guys. So um, I I wouldn't be surprised now if you have, you know, a couple corners or a defensive tackle uh, or, you know, an edge slip to the Chargers that that wasn't supposed to be there just because now Malik Willis is there and then Kenny Pickett and then maybe in third quarterback goes in that top 15. So I, I think the senior bowl has sort of started the quarterback hype that can make someone fall to the chargers at 17, much like we saw with Rashawn Slater and the five quarterbacks that were taken in the top 15 uh, last year. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of the quarterbacks, it was, uh, it was not a, a great watch this week. You know, I think the first day you understandably struggle you know, there's just not great timing between you and your receivers. And then the second day was a freaking monsoon down there in Mobile. Uh, but I, I thought that um, Malik Willis settled in nicely on the last day of practice. And I thought that Kenny Pickett did as well. Um, so I, I think those two are probably the front runners for the first two quarterbacks taken. I think for my money, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if Willis is going to be my highest graded quarterback. But if I'm a team who needs a quarterback, that's probably where I'm spending my money is on a guy with those kind of tools. Um, I mean, he just he just looks different when he throws the ball out there and, you know, you add in the mobility that he brings. So I think that's where I would go there. But like you, Alex, my major takeaway is the defensive line. I think you can throw in the edge rushers there, too, with Jermaine Johnson, who was, for my money, the best player of the week. Of course, he didn't practice on uh, Thursday and didn't play in the game rightfully so i think he earned the uh the opportunity to sit those those opportunities out but he was awesome man Larry bring up Devonta Wyatt. I thought he was great you mentioned perry on winfrey uh craig and i have messaged back and forth about travis jones from yukon of course i retweeted the shit out of videos featuring travis jones this week um but logan hall from houston had a really good week and Federian mathis from alabama had a good week and uh, make sure I get this name right from UCLA. Uh, where to go? Otito. Otito. Yeah, he had a week. Farrell from LSU had a good week. I think there are a couple edge rushers. Um, Kingsley and Agbari had a fantastic week. My J Sanders. And so this really is like if the Chargers really wanted to revamp this defensive line and really bring some juice into the unit that they haven't really had, I think you can legitimately think at this. Uh, at this upcoming draft is first round and second round being edge rusher, defensive tackle, and really bring some youth and athleticism into this group. And I honestly wouldn't hate that because there are so many good edge rushers and so many good de defensive tackles in this class. And I have to say, I'm really glad that the Jordan Davis at 17 nonsense has stopped because taking a nose tackle in the first round is just, it's just idiotic. And so, uh, take a defensive tackle in the second round if you want, not in the first round. But yeah, man, this defensive line class is awesome. It's a really good group. And you talk about, you just listed so many names and the Chargers, you know, do I want one of these guys at 17? I don't quite know. I still kind of want a corner there, but sure. there's a handful of dudes that will fall to the second round at this rate that are amazing. I mean, even not even at the, just at the senior bowl, I think uh, Brett Coleman and EJ Snyder from the bootleg football podcast they're talking about Noah Ellis, and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I I uh, leg press nine plates with one leg. And it's like, dude, <laughs> these, some of these guys are absolute freaks. Hey, you talk yeah. about Travis Jones, 
he had, I mean, I've, I've been hearing about him all week, but then I go to watch and he had some great reps. And it's not just that he had great reps because a lot of these guys did, but he was really the only guy who got the best of Boston College's Zion Johnson, who was, that's Brandon Thorne's yeah. interior offensive lineman one, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Zion's Over really green. good. Yeah, he is. And and to his to his you know credit, he was playing left guard, center, and right guard at the Senior Bowl. It's not like he had one easy to find role the entire time, but Travis Jones, man, like, there were it's a great battle between them and i'll have the senior bull footage up for everybody that steven's been downloading and we're going to work that out but it's a great battle between johnson and jones because there's one play you know johnson wins beautifully no problem the next play jones is like oh fuck this he just tosses the dude <laughs> uh no problem yeah. it, it's really really cool to watch him he talked about winfrey i thought he was great Farrell looked great Devonte wyatt man there's there's one time I forget, I forget what he was trying to do but it was something with speed in his hands Devonte wyatt was trying to beat um oh dylan parham i wrote it down thank you um it doesn't win with speed doesn't win with his hands so at some point he just grabs him and throws him like some of these guys yeah the defensive group came way more angry and way more nasty than the offensive line group there were some offensive yeah. linemen that did well don't get me wrong like zion johnson but the defenders in particular the defensive tackles nose tackle groups they came really angry they came fast these guys all look like freaks. I don't know how to judge which one is better than the other at this point. Just kind of yeah. pick which guy you like. One guy wins with power, but he's also fast, but he also has some moves. It's incredible to watch such a great group of guys go against them, you know, pretty decent talent across from them and just dominate. These guys were really, really good. So, you know, would I be super mad if they took Jordan Davis at 17? No, I would get it. But you can find someone like this, you know. Yeah. Pick somebody. There's so many guys. Eric Johnson, the guy who dominated the collegiate bowl, the pro football writers collegiate bowl, and then got invited to this. I thought he had a fantastic couple of days as well from Missouri State. There's guys from all over that are just performing yeah. so well. They could go anywhere with this, you know, with this group. I would prefer they have one of these defensive tackle and those tackle spots locked up before the draft. Sure. And but whatever's left, you know, especially if it's like a three tech, go for it. There's plenty of guys here who can do that. And the Chargers clearly have no problem at least in this regime, starting a second round pick day one. So if they need to plug and play Devontae Wyatt, go for it. Eric Johnson, whoever it is, they can pull it off. And I, I think this is a really, really good group to do it. I'm not saying Telesco has foresight or anything, but if there's any time, you know, it, it seems like he's planned this very well to have a nice defensive tackle group to pull from. And I, I think they're going to find a gem here. Yeah, the defensive class in general, like, I, you know, I, I haven't done a ton of work on the secondary, but... I mean, there were some really good corners this week at the Senior Bowl, too. Of course, Kobe Bryant from Cincinnati, um, you know, Goodrich, and Andrew Booth's teammate. I thought those two had really good weeks. And then there's Tariq uh, Wolin, I think his name is, from UTSA, who was who clocked in as the fastest corner at the Senior Bowl and clocked in at the fastest GPS tracker time in the history of the Senior Bowl. And he's 6'3". So... You know, there are a ton of quality defensive prospects in this draft. And of course, you know, it sucks that the Chargers are in this position, but, you know, they can definitely pounce on this early uh, and be able to rework this defense. I think, you know, going back to what Tyler was saying about the defensive line, my favorite exchange of the week that I saw on practice, uh, I tweeted the, the clip out, but uh, Dylan Strange, this small school center from Chattanooga, uh, you know, he's he's kind of a shorter, smaller, you know, offensive lineman as, as they tend to be from these smaller schools. And him and Logan Hall, the defensive tackle from Houston, were going at it back and forth all week long. And then on the last day of practice, you know, Logan Hall beats Strange in the first rep and then Strange beats Hall in the second rep. And they're talking shit and John back and forth. And they the, the coaching staff lines them up for a third consecutive rep. Love the fact that the national team did back-to-back -back reps for all so the much nicer. battles, too, by the way. Um, so they do the third rep, and Logan Hall wins, and MyJ Sanders and uh, Luketa, the defensive end from Penn State, Penn State. and Perion Winfrey, the, the tackle from Oklahoma, all four of them just rush to kind of, like, you know, hype up Logan Hall and talk shit to Dylan Strange. And and I love seeing that, man. Like, that's what one-on-ones are all about, particularly in the is like, Who's going to bring that nasty attitude and who's going to show that they are the more physically imposing player? So I thought Dylan Strange had a good week, but that that exchange between Strange and the rest of the defensive tackle group from uh, the national team was a lot of fun to watch for sure. 
Yeah, I, I think we mentioned uh, Jermaine Johnson, obviously, earlier. And just watching him, he reminds me a little bit uh, of Aziz Ojolari last year. Um, but I actually think his get off and his hands are, are kind of like a little bit more explosive as well. So that that's a guy that I think you kind of stash away and think about uh, in the draft. If the Chargers do get a chance to take an edge player. Um, I'll bring up another Tariq at corner. There's Tariq Castro Fields from Penn State as well. Yeah. I was really impressed with his length. He had a lot of reps that he kind of ended up winning, just kind of lands a lot of strikes, um, you know, in terms of, you know, getting those pass breakups. Um, Darion Kendrick from Georgia. We mentioned uh, Kobe Bryant. Uh, from, that name still feels weird to say. Uh, we're talking about quarters, but uh, Kobe Bryant and uh, Darion Kendrick, that just kind of made me, I feel like we had sort of kind of been getting into the zone on the show of being like, oh, well, you know, the first pick maybe has to be a corner, right? Like when talking about Booth and McDuffie, potentially Sauce Gardner, if he falls. Um, and so, you know, I think that just kind of made it clear that that day two, day three uh, in the draft, that there's going to be guys there who can make plays. Um, I don't know if Telesco is willing to wait that long, uh, depending on how yeah. they feel about Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr., but uh, I, I, I did think there are guys who can make their uh, name as a CB2 or potentially as a, a good slot corner, you know, potentially on day two, day three. Yeah, Castro Fields from Penn State really stood out to me when I was watching uh, his edge rushing teammates earlier uh, in this process. And I think he had two interceptions in one on one drills, which is kind of unheard of in one on one drills in this setting because it's really set up to be advantageous for the receivers. Uh, of course, uh, Thomas points out uh, Josh Williams from Fayetteville State, the guy that I was able to interview before the Senior Bowl. I thought he had a really good week, you know, kind of solidified, you know, him being drafted as kind of a day three guy. And I mean, he's super tall, lengthy and fast. So I think he could kind of, you know, earn some money there as well. Um, I, I think my second takeaway has to be this offensive tackle class. Um, and really, I was just kind of underwhelmed at the group mm. as a whole. Um, you know, Trevor Penning and uh, Ryman, I forget his first, Bernard Ryman, Bernard. Um, had both been mocked to the Chargers at 17 quite a lot. Of course, you know, Danny Jeremiah had them as well. And I, I just, I don't look at those two players as first round players, if I'm being completely honest with you. And I think Trevor Penning is, has an attitude. I think he's kind of like Ryan Jensen, but tackle version. Like he's going to be somebody that you want to have on your team and be that that brawler at the offensive line, but I think he's got some technique issues. I think his pad level gets way too high. I think edge rushers really gave him a problem with power, which is, you know, not what you really want to see in this kind of setting from a smaller school um, tackle. Daniel Falele, somebody else who I think, you know, he's one of the few uh, tackles in this group that actually played right tackle, but man, he, he just gets so worried about speed. And he lost inside every single time an edge rusher went inside. So I was just kind of underwhelmed as a whole. I thought Darian Kennard was probably the best of like the upper echelon guys that were in Mobile. But I wasn't necessarily like, wow. Like you're looking at, you know, Jermaine Johnson and Travis Jones and Perrion Winfrey, like completely knocked the door down and proved that they are, you know, top 50 picks. I don't think we really saw that from this tackle class. And I'm worried about Bernard Raymond's age. He's going to be 30 by the time his rookie contract is up. If he if he is first track because of that fifth year option, I think Penning he didn't really move to the right side at all. He kind of stayed on the left side. So I have some concerns about this tackle class. And I think obviously the Chargers need a right tackle. And if they wanted to take one in the first round, I'm like I'm not going to be upset about that. But I, I was just really underwhelmed by this tackle class, and I don't think anyone really established themselves as the guy coming out of Mobile. Yeah, it was really unfortunate. Those those three guys that you mentioned are really that tier two, and all of them at different points have been mocked to the Chargers by whoever. Yeah. And I was just waiting for someone to separate themselves, and the only person that did was Raymond, but for the wrong reasons. I think <laughs> he kind of had the worst uh, you know, week of rough. anybody, uh, at least of those three guys. And like you said, he's, he's he's 25. He's going to be 25 when the season starts. He's from Austria, I believe, and is, is in his second year. He's had learned the position for two years. There's a lot of tools there, and Daniel Jeremiah likes him a lot. But this is an all-in team the Chargers are supposedly going to have. I don't know if that's a guy you really want to start at right tackle next season. Could it be an upgrade over what they had in Storm Norton? Maybe, but 
I just don't think that's the guy you yeah. want there with so many other prospects. I right now, you know, before the, the senior bowl had penning just a little bit ahead of Falele and then Raymond, a good little portion down below that. That's kind of the same for me at this point. You know, yeah. they all had good reps, penning had good reps, Falele had good reps. I don't know if Raymond had good reps, but you know, <laughs> those two guys, you know, had some good reps. And like I'll give Falele credit. Day one, destroyed by Sanders. Day yeah. three, if I'm not mistaken, he beat Sanders and he he was the one who sat down Sanders during those drills and he looked just fine during the team portion. So, you know, there's something there, of course, but I'm just not super stoked about those three guys. And, you know, if they if they take one again, it could probably be an upgrade, but that's just not a lot there. Like they're not bad players by any means. Sure. All of them have question marks and none of them separated themselves. And so it's just going to be kind of like a meh pick for me. If you're if, like, honestly, if you tell me to pick between one of them or Davis, I'm just going to go with Davis at that point. Cause at least you have, I think an elite player at two downs. Whereas these guys, I just, I don't know. Oh, this, Jordan these, Davis. You mean Jordan Davis, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, other than that, you know, like Max Mitchell got beat pretty often. Kennard. I didn't really think look all that great. Um, as far as interior guys go, I think Ed Ingram from LSU looked good. I think he was very impressive at several points. Obviously, Zion Johnson. Um, yeah. I think Braxton Jones had some moments that I liked. Otherwise, like I just the defensive guys just came to ball. And yeah. a lot of these offensive guys just were not ready. So, you know, I'll have to watch their team portions more. I'll have to watch the senior bowl all the way through. But one on ones and some of the stuff I saw in team portions just kind of underwhelmed. And I'm at this point, unless the you know cross falls with the chargers like in that mock draft today yeah. i'm out like i'm out i'm out there's no way i could go into the season taking one of those guys at 17 and that's going to be my immediate starter like if you go kelly right and then you take them at 17 maybe but that's a waste but i, I just couldn't go into the draft knowing that i'm going to take one of those guys at 17 they're going to be my starter that just doesn't seem like good value to me yeah, so we we had a uh, OT at uh, what OT at thirteen last year, maybe now no OT at thirteen. Uh, <laughs> so perhaps that's the takeaway from the Senior Bowl. Yeah, um, yeah, I kind of coincide. I mean, part of this is I think we're spoiled a little bit last year when we talked about Sewell and Slater and Darisaw and like all these guys that were just you know could ready. Re re I mean, really from the draft felt like ready to play day one, just stick them in. Um, and there's just not that guy there. I mean, Trevor Penning, uh, like we talked about, just I uh, felt like there were some technique issues. Um, and then you kind of have like some of the tier two tackles kind of getting blown up as well. Um, not to say that there's not talent. And, you know, obviously every senior bowl is going to be different with the, you know, the quality of talent on defense, you know, from year to year. And that's going to make the offensive guys, you know, on some level look worse. But they they had a feast when it came to those guys uh, on the offensive line. And so I, yeah, I'm not comfortable right now taking an offensive weapon. And it's like Tyler said, uh, or taking an offensive tackle, I should say. And uh, yeah. if you want Jordan Davis, like I, I think that's kind of the argument for him over, say, an offensive tackle is just that he pops more on tape and it looks like a more dynamic player. Or even if it's a receiver at 17, like a, a Jameson Williams, uh, or one of those guys that looks good, I'd, I'd kind of rather have that over, you know, Trevor Penning, who I, you know, think can maybe be the eventual right tackle one day, but just can't get in there now um, and, and look much better than Storm Norton. Like, I, yeah. I, I don't think that's, you know, the kind of difference that we're talking about with, like, Sam Tevy versus Rashawn Slater last year, right? Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that, this class is kind of a little bit disadvantaged by last year's, but they just didn't look impressive at all. And I don't think there's a guy that the Chargers can take at 17 that they can just plug in at right tackle, much like they did Slater last year. No, definitely not at that level or, or anything close to it. But I, I think like right now, if I had to pick one at 17, I probably would choose Kennard just because I feel like he's probably the most pro ready of that second tier. I would trust that he would be an elite run blocker from day one. But all these other tier two tackles, like I just, I'd have a really hard time starting them from day one. And that's what you have to do. You're taking a first round tackle at 17. You have to start them from day one. And so, you know, heading into the senior bowl, I think Tyler and I at least were on the same page. You know, I think Alex as well about, you know, signing like a mid tier veteran and then potentially drafting a tackle in the third round, fourth round and, and you know, giving that tackle kind of a red shirt season like they did with Brandon Hymas. And I think that was solidified, right? Whether it's Dennis Kelly 
Morgan Moses, you know, whoever they decide to potentially sign. I think that's that's probably the best thing for this team because I, I don't think any of these you know, smaller school guys or, or canard are truly ready to like step in right away at 17. So, uh, at this point, in my opinion, at 17, I think you take the best defensive prospect on the board, whoever that is in on your board and then kind of roll with it. I, I would understand them going receiver, especially if they lose Mike Williams. But, um, I, I, as things are trending right now, of course, you know, there's still a month until free agency, but, um, I think me personally, it's best defensive player on the board is going to be who like I'm I mock to the team who I advocate for the team uh going forward and, and, barring of course a a very strong and disastrous fall from Charles Cross like uh Joe Marino had in his mock draft today yeah and I'm all for that don't enter the draft to, like absolutely needing a right tackle and absolutely yeah. needing a nose tackle I think as long as you can avoid those things mm, yeah and a receiver that's okay but uh, just avoid demanding and needing a nose tackle and a right tackle at 17 i just think if you take it like i guess i understand but you should try to avoid it because i just don't think the guy's going to be there that you want and like you said best defensive player available I, I, if they have to pass on booth or gardner or whoever because they need to take raymond because they need a right tackle that's gonna suck well yeah. okay, no offense to raymond but like come on like the the corner prospect was there and you just set yourself up to be forced to take that right tackle can't do it so i'm all i'm all for the veteran whoever it is I'm putting my money on Kelly, obviously, because it makes sense. Whoever it is, just an above average, average, better than Storm Norton starter, and then find someone else later on. Yeah, I just feel like the the need last year was like a lot worse than it was this year. Like they do yeah. need a right tackle, but totally. not as bad as they needed, you know, a blind side blocker for Justin Herbert. And, and the quality, obviously, is not. Uh, as much as it was last year when we talked about those offensive tackle guys and you know yeah I mean if they were just to take like you know Trevor Penning while you know Booth or McDuffie's on the board I'd be like uh, I mean okay like you can do that but you know it, it's one of those things where I think you go for potential over position in that scenario and I feel like you could just kind of want to go with one of those cornerbacks or even one of those wide receivers um, so for for me I wouldn't say I'm fully out on right tackle at 17, but I, I feel like we're certainly kind of getting to that point, especially depending on if they do get a Dennis Kelly or someone that can kind of stabilize the right tackle spot in free agency. Yeah, right. And that's kind of where I'm at. They don't like they need their right tackle version of Odi Ibushi this year. Like they just need somebody to come in, be healthy, be somebody that has a history of staying healthy, uh, which of course Dennis Kelly does have and he would be cheap. So um, that's where I'm at in terms of, other positions that stand out, uh, I have to give a shout out to Christian Watson, the receiver from North Dakota State, uh, who for my money was the best receiver in Mobile this week and just moves at such an incredible level for somebody who's 6'4". Like he was listed at 6'2 on North Dakota's website and checked in close to 6'4 uh, at, at the Senior Bowl. So he was their yards after catch guy. He was their end around guy while also being the jump ball guy. Um, he's somebody that I think is going to, you know, bring a lot of value to a team, probably in the second or third round. Brett Coleman thinks he could be a first round player. Mm -hmm. I'm not all the way there. Um, but I, I thought Watson was the best receiver group. And frankly, like there weren't a ton of other ones that were like crazy impressive to me. Um, I really liked what I saw from Velas Jones as, as somebody as like a late day three target, the Memphis receiver, I forget his name. I think it's Calvin Austin. Uh, the five, seven receiver who just looks like the receiver version of Kyler Murray. Um, you know, he's a fun player, man. And he's got some crazy, crazy juice. And, you know, I know that there were a lot of concerns, you know, on Twitter of like, well, he's so small, like he doesn't have play strength. And I'm like, who cares? If you can't touch him, who cares, man? Like the dude is legitimately fast, fast. Uh, so I think, you know, Jalen Tolbert was another one who kind of stood out to me, but I think for in terms of the best receivers that I saw, it was Watson and then probably Alvin Austin from Memphis. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to watch any of the skill position, guys. It sounds like it just wasn't really an impressive. It wasn't a great group. wide receiver group. You probably didn't also get a lot of help from your quarterbacks either. Yes, but yeah, I mean, allowed. Watson sounds like the way I, I had never heard of this guy. <laughs> uh, I haven't done a whole lot of homework on wide receivers, but then the way Coleman and these guys were talking about him. It's like, wait, he's he's does all, everything and he does it well and he's productive. It, I was impressed. So I don't know who he is. I'll have to go watch him. But it sounds like people are very high on him. So if he stood out, great. Uh, 
out of curiosity, did Josh Palmer play at the Senior Bowl? He did, yeah. He did. Okay. Hmm, yep. Interesting. Well, they had Palmer and uh, Hymas last McKitty. year, who was also the Senior Bowl. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and McKitty well. and Webb, too. Oh, Jeez. well, so that's four of them. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was only two. So, yeah, that was definitely more than I thought. Um, my other takeaway from the senior bowl, I think I mentioned the running backs earlier when you have Abram Smith and some of these other guys, even Stevens guy, uh, TJ Pledgler. Uh, I, I, you know, he had a good run at the senior bowl. Not yeah, that I'm yeah. you know, necessarily advocating for taking him, <laughs> but I, I thought he looked fun, had a little bit of juice to him. Uh, and now I'm sort of talking myself into uh, also the Missouri, oh, no. back, <laughs> the Missouri running back, Batty. And I'm sort of like, don't do it. Do I want to do another day three running back? Uh, I, I hate myself for saying that. But there are some guys that do have some explosiveness in this class. Can we not take a guy who runs a five flat 40? You know, I don't know. Uh, that that seems to be it. Yeah, I don't know. Telesco doesn't really like running backs with juice in the draft very often. So uh, <laughs> if we could get one, that would be fun. But I don't necessarily trust Telesco to make the decisions at running back in the draft anymore. But there were some guys uh, like Abram Smith and others that just kind of flashed at the senior bowl when I wasn't expecting it. Yeah, uh, Lorenzo McDaniel, thank you for pointing out Boye Mafe. He was somebody that yes. uh, was fantastic this week, probably the second best edge rusher besides Jermaine Johnson, somebody that was fantastic in the game. So uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, unfortunately, forgot him earlier. Um, somebody pointed out tight ends too. You know, it wasn't a great group. I thought that it's a bunch of solid prospects, not necessarily, again, somebody that like knocked the door down and proved that they were the top dog. Um, Trey McBride from Colorado State appears to be the favorite of like draft Twitter. You know, a lot of the draft network guys and um, the PFF guys really like Trey McBride. I thought Jake Ferguson from Wisconsin really showed some good things as somebody is like an all around tight end, not necessarily a great athlete, but somebody that is just a really solid route runner, blocker, and everything like that. I think if the Chargers are trying to replace Jared Cook and get like a legitimate tight end, I would go with Greg Dulcich, the tight end from UCLA, former receiver. I think he's probably the best combination of receiving upside, yards after catch ability, and athleticism. Um, you know, somebody that they could potentially split out wide. I was a little disappointed in Isaiah Likely. Had some really bad drops this week, the tight end from Coastal Carolina. Um, so if I had to pick, like, best tight end of the week, I'd probably go with Dulcich by a hair. And Jake Ferguson probably would be right behind him. Sounds awesome. Couldn't tell you who most of these guys are, <laughs> but I am very confident in this coaching staff and Kevin Coger to get these tight ends yeah. up to speed. I mean, we got a blocking tight end. They was like, who the hell is this? Turned out to be a legitimate blocker for the team and a potential tight end too. So they take a receiving option. I think the same kind of development can be expected of them. For sure. Yeah, there was uh, Jelani Woods. I, was Woods the one that uh, was like Mo Alley Cox 2.0, the, the huge oh, like 6'8 tight second. end from Virginia? I wrote it. I wrote all the notes down. Give me one second. You can just keep talking. Uh, there was, yes, there was... yes, Mo Ali Cox with acceleration. <laughs> so there you go. Like, there's a dart throw, you know, third round pick that they could potentially turn into Mo Ali Cox. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, there were a couple good tight ends, it sounds like, at the Shrine Bowl overall. So this is a good tight end class, much better than last year's, where Trey McKitty in this class is probably like a fifth or sixth round pick. And so uh, you know, this is a really good group, uh, you know, a day three, third round pick kind of group. So, uh, like I said, I feel like Greg Dulcich was probably the best one, uh, followed by Jake Ferguson this week. Mo Ali Cox with acceleration sounds absolutely horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> Defender and someone's running at you. So, yes, I would like that on this team. Imagine the Chargers two main receiving tight ends, both being six, eight, <laughs> just behemoths after the catch. Like that would just be unheard of for, you know, modern NFL football. And for what it's worth, Mo Ali Cox did, I think, come in at top four or five of my free agent tight end composite rankings. Not that they need to go get Mo Ali Cox, but if you can find him with acceleration, it bodes well for his future. <laughs> just get it a does. bunch of like NBA 6'8 freaks. <laughs> yeah. Just go down beyond that. would be fun. We got the biggest quarterback in the league. Now we just need the two biggest tight ends. You know, maybe that's why we'll draft Daniel Falele just because we, we're just collecting size, you know, huge human beings. Uh, you know, like Mike McDaniel, you know, new coach of the uh, Miami Dolphins was saying, if you can engineer everybody to be seven feet, 400 pounds, we'll take them. 
uh, you know, Chargers going all in on the size this year. Yeah, two jokes are too easy. Move on. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> okay, all right. Sounds good. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Any uh, final thoughts here on the Senior Bowl before we head out for uh, for the evening? No, I, I just can't wait to review all of it. I have not looked at the skill position guys at the tight ends or running backs, yeah. obviously. So I can't wait to dive into those. And then throughout the week, pretty soon, both on Patreon and on YouTube, we're going to have all the Senior Bowl stuff up. So those of you that weren't didn't have access to it, or want to look at it it's going to be up pretty soon so we're going to try to work that out it's going to take a bit it's going to be a lot of man hours i have a coffee ready to go tonight there but i will go. try to get that to you guys as soon as possible yeah i think i think it's important to remember the senior bowl is as fascinated as we are with size some good things do come in small packages as well for some of the guys who are under six feet so you know uh that that would be a good thing for the senior bowl uh if you want to get some of those some of those smaller athletic running backs in tyler i see your face right now do not even think about it Oh, I thought you were just going after me for being the only person under six foot on this podcast. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, yeah. I mean, I kind of was. <laughs> that would have been a perfect time to transition to a, a Manscaped ad, but uh, unfortunately, they yeah, decided to leave us hanging. <laughs> All right, guys. Good stuff. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this live stream. It's been a, a fun conversation today. Um, we are going to take this weekend off, as it is the Super Bowl, but we'll still have an episode on Wednesday for you guys. And then we have uh, a, quite a few interviews coming up. Hopefully, you know, Tyler and I can get some more prospect interviews going. Um, there might be a certain analyst from PFF on the show on Tuesday. So uh, we'll see how that one goes. But there's going to be a ton of draft content. Lots of people who were at the Senior Bowl will be joining the show to kind of give their thoughts as well. Uh, so as always, thank you guys for your support. Please leave us a rating or review on the podcast platform of your choice and subscribe to the channel. We're pretty close to uh, hitting our next goal. So uh, if you're not subscribed, please go do that. Turn the notifications on. We do really appreciate all the support. And as always, bolt up. <laughs>